recognize several different rights and forces with, you know, there's a, I would imagine here, a sympathy for Assange, who's mm -hmm. taking side, even though there are... Is there? It's an equal right. I don't know, maybe there is, but, some, some but someone who's like, no, or, the, you know, I really hate Bradley Manning, because like my, my father-in-law answered at me for about half an hour about how he hates Bradley Manning, because this guy was a mil uh, an American military guy, and he's like, well, he made a code of honor in the military, and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, but yet people have taken sides. But what might be interesting is I wondered in Antigone if the Greek audience would have themselves particularly had very strong convictions about whether there should be a burial or whether there should be a something else. Because if they don't, then what they're being presented it with is basically the a, a kind of a form, for want of a better word, a formalism of ambiguity, which allows them to see an ambiguity that maybe in their daily lives in the midst of contradictions which are actually maybe forcing them to take sides mm -hmm. or which they you know are more liable to take sides if they don't have this distanciation um in in that case it's an illumination um, and it's an illumination for us as well in that respect so there's a there's a good reason to leave here yeah i mean that's that, that's right i mean it's um yeah, we don't know what the spectators saw um we know something, um, yeah, more than a little something about how, let's say, um, life in the city of Athens was organised, um, which then makes what was going on in theatre quite strange, because from what we can tell, again, we was talking yesterday about um, sexual, uh, um, the politics of sexual difference in classical Athens whether there are clear roles assigned to men and women, and tragedy seems to be messing with that an awful lot. Um, something is revealed by that. I, I, I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's that different from, to that extent, I don't think it's that different from how it might be for us. You know? When we um, <clears throat> drift through life a certain way and then we see something, a movie or something or whatever it might be which allows us to uh, grasp the or at least allows us to see uh, the basic tensions that might constitute who we are or the deception that we happen to live right? I mean that's to go back to that original quote I mean that's the that's the strange thing is that uh, you know it, it's deception that makes us uh, wise and it's a certain um, ability to occupy a space of deception and fraud and cheating and trickery. That's what tragedy is up to. And to um, imagine that one can give that up in the name of an idea of philosophical truth is naive. I don't think for a minute that Plato you know, was that naive, but you know, it's part of what the philosophical project has become. That, as it were, we, we look at a field of praxis and we're given you know, a theoretical grid to understand it. I think that's, um, I think we need a, a more complex picture. Um, so, um, a good thing to take, take away would also be the idea that, um, I guess any form of ism, you know, that um, I think the minute that one becomes convinced of any particular view is always dangerous. Potentially, I think you have to, you know, it's just there's a necessity for belief. In the sense that when I'm reading Hegel, I believe Hegel. I don't think every sentence that this is nonsense. I think I'm completely with him. But um, uh, there has to be this both this moment of, as it were, suspension of disbelief in the act of reading and trying to comprehend something, and then, um, but a suspicion about forms of dogmatism that that can slide into. And you see this all the time with the uses of philosophy. Um, and that worries me. You know, and it's often through the philosophies that might be the most fashionable. Right? And so, you know, 20 years ago, everybody was in the art world was quoting Derrida. Now they're quoting whoever they're quoting. You know. It's, we need something more than that sort of. Uh, fashion-driven certainty, it seems to me. Right? Um, 
other places. And also another thing to just to emphasize is, is something about the relationship between philosophy and literature. The literature, and by literature we're using in literature is like a, no, it's the wrong, tragedy in this case, philosophy and tragedy. And tragedy is like a sort of shorthand for art. I don't think it's philosophy's role to, um, you know, to dictate to uh, the artist. It's not, as it were, a top-down relationship. It, it's about um, acts of reading, attention, and uh, yeah, acts of reading, attention, and interpretation, where you, um, um, which are conceptual, but which are conceptual in a way that is attempts to be close to the grain of the thing that you're trying to attend to. And there's a tendency in the relationship between philosophy and, and art to, again, see philosophy as some kind of transparent set of grid or set of concepts that one can download into an experience and explain it. I think that's naive. The theory-practice relationship has to be more complicated than that. So again, I, I've been trying to give the um, uh, the burden of things over to tragedy, right? And in, and in these tragedies, we're not told what to think. For me, that's crucial. We're not told what to think. We're presented with a situation that's complex, and where questions are raised, um, and we can bring our different vocabularies to bear on that. classicist at Oxford. Um, it's not very exciting work, but he basically, you know, as a classicist, hammers this Dionysian idea. You know, he just shows that it's based on really bad philology and a kind of romantic belief in causes and all that stuff. So, that, you know, so there's, a, there's been a shift in uh, uh, Hellenic studies or classical Hellenic studies away from this 19th century German romantic idea of the Dionysian and ritual towards something something else. So I'm sort of following that. Mm -hmm. And also Vernon was very important for that approach. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure that I am convinced of that. But the, the, the pharmacon, uh, to me, that's, that's a religious sacrifice. And that uh, um, as far as I know, uh, before Aristotle, Pharma was just a purely sacrificial term. That this was this this was a human sacrificial victim who was <coughs> paraded through the city and soaked up all the toxins from the city and then taken outside. And I don't I don't know how the Greeks killed their victims, stoned them or something. Um, <laughs> but uh, bored them to death. That's and <laughs> I'm by no means an expert. But the little tiny bit that I've dabbled among mm -hmm. contemporary scholars that are looking not just at the Greeks but at other ancient uh, yeah. ritualistic cultures, mm -hmm. um, I mean, to, to me, it, it just sounds like religion. Uh, well, whatever that. Is. Okay, okay, okay. Um, uh, there's an anthropologist at the New School just turned up. Nice guy called Ido, and. Um, uh, I, gave, I was talking to him, we had a drink a few months ago, and I went into this ritual versus you know, the move from myth to, to legality. <coughs> uh, but he said, but you've got this idea of ritual as somehow uh, unthinking, right? as if people engaged in rituals are just sort of doing it 
Whereas this is a ritual, if you look, any anthropologist will tell you that ritual is a more complicated concept than that. So you might want to complicate the idea of ritual. So tragedy could be a ritual in that sense. If a ritual is something that uh, involves that, that kind of ambiguity. Right? Um, so we've got this idea of ritual as we blindly submit and engage in something, and that might be completely wrong. Right? Ritual is something we do. Um, the human the sacrifice thing, I just don't know. I mean, and I don't think anybody really knows. I mean, I am always suspicious of the uh, desire to discover evidence of sacrifice um, on the one hand and to discover think about another connection with this is think about the um, early colonization of the Caribbean right which often turned on the um, uh, discovery of cannibals right? evidence for cannibalism is actually quite rare you know in the world not that it doesn't happen it hasn't happened but there's not, and it's not my work, so it's second hand, but based on some, a guy called Peter Hume, who used to be a colleague of mine, he used to work on the Caribbean. His view is that, you know, evidence for cannibalism in the Caribbean is pretty slim. But the Europeans were finding it everywhere, mm. right? These people are eating flesh, they're slaughtering children, and so, so the, the, the identification of sacrifice is, there's something, um, it, it says more about our desire than about what actually might be the case. I think right the way down to uh, the somewhat pathetic spectacle of a bunch of French intellectuals wandering into the Bois de Boulogne, led by Bataille, to engage in a human sacrifice or not, in the Asifar group in the late 30s, who knows what they did. But it would be just like us, right? We sort of say, let's go, let's go do a human sacrifice. Tonight, we're going to do it, right? Someone's going to get it. And we stand around, sort of look at each other, have a couple of beers, <laughs> and joints. And, but we never look at it, you know. We're, you know it's, gonna be, it's not going to be that different. And it's, it would be sort of crap anyway if we did it. It would be sort of laughable. And, um, so it's this, So there's, there's something about that with sacrifice that worries me. And I think it's more like, you know, I think it's, it's more like, and it's more like that, right? Uh, that would be a pouring of a libation, right? right? And that, so when they're talking about let's let us let's pour libations to the gods, it's not that. And before you drink or when you drink something, you honour the gods, the ancestors, the gods of the household, your family. It's just respect, you know. It's um, what what does that action involve, right? Do you have to believe that to do that? I mean. It's, this then raises a really deep question <coughs> about the nature of belief, which in many ways this course is, this seminar has been picking up. I mean, it's, I, I don't, the, so there is this, as in the fantasy of the exotic Greeks, where we believe that they, I believe that they believe, right? They really believed. I'm in a time of the world's darkening, nihilism, self-consciousness, Hamlet, but they really believed. My, 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 uh, thought has been, well, maybe they didn't believe either. They were skeptics like us. Um, who's not a skeptic? Um, what is belief? Belief is something that they have. Right? You feel this politically, say, in the US, right? Belief is something they have. We have... Uh, what do we have? <laughs> Law? Daily Show, a sense of moral superiority, you know. But I don't know, I mean, you know, and, and I think the, I don't want to get into, you know, too much of cultural studies type stuff, but the, um, the Obama moment, you know, in 2008 was about belief, that perhaps we could believe, you know, and that uh, became, you know, remember that, that the speech at Mile High Stadium in wherever that was, where is that Arizona or something? Yeah. Denver. Denver. The Mile High Stadium speech, and you really saw the, you know, you saw the, the desperate will to believe on the part of the audience, right? The big rum and cons and everything. And and the cla the classical background, absolutely neoclassical background, and um, 
you know, Black Oedipus, to quote that film. And then we have, uh, you know, and then, you know, but it's, and it's completely understandable because um, of what had happened between 2000 and 2008. Uh, but who believes what? What, do, what is belief? I, I was reading and showing about the, his, he hadn't talked that much about the function of the chorus. Indeed. And he says something about how the chorus arrests, uh, arrests him, the spectator, entirely yeah. through art. And then also at the same, same time thinking about um, the way Heidegger destroys the context that would make the chorus a dialectical. Yeah. Um, would, would allow us as a spectator of the spectators. Right? Yeah. We, we are not the Greeks, even though we're, you, you're bringing us very close, but we are still watching the Greeks. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So I'm just, it's, 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 for me, the issue of the chorus also. Yeah, we've not the, 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 in, in this In developing this notion of ambiguity, I'm still left with the feeling that someone is telling me what to think. Um. Right? Well, or something. Oh yeah, like like in the contemporary views, like the you know, you know the chorus could also be seen as media, for example. Yes. Right? Not, not that not the tragedy itself is media, but the chorus as the mediator, the media. Yeah. yeah right. Yes. 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 So I'm still left with the impression of, of of how do we interrogate that 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 whatever that's telling us what to think. Yeah. And no, that's a good point. Say again. And the chorus can laugh then. Uh. They can be, I mean, in, in comedy, yeah, in the chorus of satyrs can be, a, yeah, a very much canned laughter. But the idea, in a sense, that we have, uh, we haven't focused much on the chorus, and it's, um, I ask myself why. Because also in Shakespeare, there's, you know, is there, there's no, no chorus. chorus right? There's no chorus. Um, there's the aside, right, which isn't, it's there, but not in the same way. You know, there's the moment in Elizabethan theatre when you, now I am alone. Yeah. And we, we're being spoken to directly, so that so that would be the function of the chorus. The chorus, so there's the action on stage, these characters tearing each other to pieces, and then we have the mediation of the chorus. But there's no distinct body. There's no distinct bodies. <clears throat> but the um, there's almost you know you're right. It's like um, if uh, the dramatic action is the news, then the chorus is the editorial. The chorus is the editorial, so and you are being told what to think, right? The crayon comes on stage makes the speech I said, then we get the chorus's response. But Heidegger then destroys the... Heidegger does what he does with it, right? But it is the, the chorus, you know, so the, you know, the chorus has been seen as, uh, for Nietzsche, the womb of tragedy. It's the image he uses. Uh, Schiller as the ideal spectator. Um, um, uh, others are the, as the people. Common idea that the chorus is us in our sort of ideal form, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, it's undeniable that the history of tragedy is the history of the uh, shriveling of the chorus. Again, we don't know what to make of that. I mean, there have been thousands of interpretations of that which are usually negative. So we begin where, where the chorus has a huge role in Aeschylus, and there's the suppliant maidens. Where the parts are, the parts of the maidens are all meant to be spoken together. Right? So the entire dialogue would have been, let's say, however many maidens there are, you know, ten maidens speaking in unison. So the movement from that to the chorus in Sophocles, which has this this function to Euripides, where the chorus seems to have a reduced role. So we could, and many people do, give a, a direct political interpretation of the chorus in that regard. Right? So if what happens in classical tragedy is tragedy is pol politics, and um, uh, then the, then the the vehicle of politics, the political body, is 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 articulated by the chorus. So insofar as the chorus disappears, that political body dies. Right? But on the other hand. The yeah, it it does. It it comments. Um, it changes as well. I mean, the chorus in the Oresteia in the Agamemnon is a chorus of old men who are loyal to Agamemnon and are waiting for him to come back. 
Um, in other, in other situ in this, in Sophocles, the chorus seems more neutral, although it will admonish both sides. The chorus will often criticise. Mm. So the chorus is not one thing. The chorus will shift. Mm. It will be a chorus of women or a chorus of men, or a chorus of male and female characters. Um, you, rather than being told what to think, I think you're being certain questions are being articulated. So I think that moment that I quoted <coughs> at the end of the Seven Against Thieves, "What shall I do?" And for me, that's the question that the chorus raises. We see, we see lives being torn apart, and the question, well, "What, what now? Which way do I go?" And that's helpful, I don't know, it's a, it's a good good question. Um, do we have, by way I mean um, academics, whatever, have any idea what, um, how many times is, say, Oedipus, right? Was performed? Was, was put, um, I mean, yeah. To the, you know, general same audience. Not many times, I mean, it was performed, I mean, plays were written for the, <coughs> for the, uh, the city Dionysia in March, April, and they were performed once there. And there was a second festival um, elsewhere in Attica, and there were reports of other festivals. Not f so maybe it would have got another showing somewhere, and that would have been it. Oh, yeah. And so then the reception would not necessarily change over time. Yes, th that's right. And, and then um, by the early fourth century, sorry, by the early fourth century, so in the three nineties, seems to be clear that uh, and later about 387 or something like that, there are revivals of tragedy. And then that becomes a second festival. We've got, as it were, the new tragedy festival, then the so new school, old school. Right? And you pick which one you want to go to. And then there would have been reviving the old tragedies. And it appears that of the three tragedians, uh, Euripides was most often produced. Uh, and indeed, in the United States, um, if you do a statistical uh, analysis, uh, if that's the right word, of the production of tragedies in schools and elsewhere, Euripides is the most produced of the three tragedians. Why? A very strong role for women, no? There's that. So it's a very, you've got some very strong female roles, so who wouldn't want to be Medea or Phaedra? So this is sort of, you know this this goes back to say 60s 70s the, the, the things that I've seen. There's a guy at Columbia in theatre studies that gave me some figures which are interesting. Aeschylus and, ma and many plays just don't get don't appear at all. So the actual the canon is very small. And what you find with um, philosophers is they'll know one or two tragedies and they'll then extrapolate from that to the whole thing. The thing is there are 31 and they're all different, which is also my point, right? There are 31, there are structures which repeat, but there are many, many different things going on here. So the idea that we can identify the essence of the tragic with some philosophical confidence, I think, is a delusion. Um, so another thing I'd like to take away is, is to look at something like tragedy in its variousness right? and um, its historical variousness, which for me isn't... Um, a bad thing. I mean, this is you know, the idea that we can see through that to some essence. I think is a, is a kind of philosophical delusion. And um, another thing I'd add to this would be that um, <coughs> um, uh, philosophy is a strongly homosocial activity from its beginning. Yeah? It's a relationship established between older men or an older man and younger men, most often. And women, if they appear in platonic dialogues, appear as the over-emotional wife that has to be kicked out of uh, the apology because she's weeping, she's brought the kids in because you know, husband's dying. And the first thing Socrates does is to say to Xanthippus, his wife, you know, you know, get out. I want to be with my boys, you know. <laughs> with my boys. I'm going to die. It's going to be great. And, um, or uh, you get the idealised feminine figure in the figure of Diasima, the, 
goddess who speaks the truth of love, who, with whom Socrates has a, uh, a direct relation. And you could argue that philosophy has been homosocial ever since. Right? Uh, up to, you know, pick your moment, Mary Wollstonecraft or, you know, whoever. Uh, the, uh, the, the extraordinary thing about tragedy is if you, as I want to do, um, want to argue I'm a kind of Freudian, right? I mean, to, to come out, you know, as, I'm a kind of Freudian. And for me, um, psychoanalysis is not just about the unconscious, which is neither here nor there. The unconscious has been around for hundreds of years. It's about the, um, the gendered unconscious, right? It's about the way in which the unconscious might be, and desire might be formed in relationship to formations of gender and the articulation of sexual desire. If you're interested in that stuff, tragedy is an extraordinary place. Because suddenly the whole economy, the whole thing has changed. You've got what, you know. Again, uh, we don't know what these things were for. This could just be men dressing up as women and having a good time, right? The, such things happen. But even if that's true, it's our blood that feeds them now. And so from, this is where for, you know, doing the thing with Judith, I mean, in thinking about someone like her work uh, as uh, the blood with which we now read something like ancient tragedy, it looks like gender trouble. Right? Whether it is or not, who knows? But from where we are, wow. You know? And I find that a much richer universe than the universe of um, certain views of philosophy. So, yeah, seriously. Does that make any sense? Um, how do we really, you know, um, how do we really, um, philosophy is the discourse of the master, right? in, uh, in, in Lacanian terms. <clears throat> I mentioned that thing the other day about you revolutionaries want a master, you will get one. Um, and how does one genuinely try and question the position of master discourse in philosophy? Right? And it seems to me that a risk, say, of, of bad use approach is a certain reassertion of the master discourse, which he will, he knows that, he's steeped in Lacan, but he will say at certain moments that there's a need for the master. I'm not so sure about that. Right? So the world of um, so there's a sense in which um, uh, we have a, a, a kind of faith in philosophy as a as a series of master discourses, uh, and then our task is to translate those master discourses into terms that we understand, and then use those concepts and talk about deterritorialization and the rhizome and whatever. And that, I think, is, is a questionable activity. That seems to be like a, a form of philosophical abstraction for me. Right? If you're interested in destabilizing that master discourse that is philosophy, then tragedy is a, another fantastic area to think about because it looks as if that is up for grabs. And that's something I want to think through. Um, so if you're recognizing the paradox of the situation as an older man speaking to younger people in a situation, you know, <laughs> the reflexivity of the, the irony here is palpable, right? <laughs> anyway, so. So if you're mapping this onto these different discourses, would, would tragedy then, then be the hysterics discourse, or how does... Oh, that's good. What do you think? Uh, that's my guess, but I'm not sure. And I, I mean, <coughs> I'm trying to anticipate your conclusion. It's it, sometimes it sounds like you're I, trying to submerge philosophy back into tragedy. Yes. Sort of dunk it underwater, and then yes. and then it's not philosophy anymore. It's yes. it's some kind of non-philosophy or some kind of anti-philosophy. Yeah. And yeah. And at that point, uh, I'm not I'm not really sure what to name it, but maybe it's 
it's it's hysteria. But this is interesting uh, because Zizek, in, I think it was his dissertation, which was on Hegel, the title was something like uh, Hegel, a, a hysteric. And the most sublime of hysterics. Yes. Hmm. It's an early book. Yeah, I mean, okay, this is this is an interesting question. <coughs> Um, a couple of things. Um, there's an image in uh, in Derrida's book Gla, which uh, really hit me when I read that about 30 years ago, uh, when I was a graduate student. And he has this image for uh, reading. And he says reading is um, <coughs> uh, having your head stuck into the water, under the water of a text, and then periodically you're brought up for air, and then you go back in and you're pulled out. And he says, this is, the, this is the, the rhythm of the relationship between language and meta-language, he says. You know, we need to be immersed in, we need to read as closely as we can in, you know, with all of the scholarly uh, stipulations that we can require. These, these things are important for me. Um, and then we need to pull back for air and get some distance. Uh, the problem with philosophy is that it often, you know, goes fishing, you know? and you cast out a line and you pull in something and you say, "Here is a confirmation of my thesis." Right? And that can be you know, that, that anybody can, you know, that can be a that's pernicious potentially. And furthermore, the sh so. <coughs> So what I want to say, I don't believe that we can have a pure immersion. In, we, have, we need to breathe, right? We're, in that sense, amphibious. But we need to have a, a, a rhythm of, of reading. And, you know, so, I, for example, I wrote a, a book on Wallace Stevens a few years ago, uh, which was you know, important to me. I don't think it's a great book, but it's all right. And it was, it was a hard one to write, although it's very short. But uh, what interested me in Stevens was the fact that Stevens was able to carry a philosophical thought in verse. Right? And it didn't require a philosopher to extrapolate that thought into a series of propositions. Right? And furthermore, when Stevens extrapolated it into a series of propositions, it was a disaster. What he developed was a form of thinking, which was verse, an idiosyncratic form of verse, and that verse was able to carry extraordinarily complex forms of thought, usually in the form of hypothetical constructions in Stevens, as if, you know, and if you read Stevens, it's, it's sort of five different things going on at once. Um, it's philosophy, it's complicated imagery, it's bathos, it's jokes, it's neologisms, and so, you know, uh, how does one attend to that? How does one, attend? that's a question that's interested me a lot. You know, you can pull, or again, Beckett is someone I've tried to think about this in relationship to. The issue is not pulling some philosophical uh, message out of Beckett. That would be stupid, right? It's to try and engage in a reading of Beckett where you allow Beckett to uh, uh, challenge and undermine the meta language that you're bringing to it. And then you've got something like a reading, I think. Then, then something is happening, and that's what I'm after. With the tragedies, it's difficult because the distance and the language. The hysteria, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, the, um, the problem with philosophy and philosophers, in particular male philosophers, is there is a cold, obsessional core at the heart of philosophy, which is uh, incapable of an act of love, if I can speak in such frank terms. And... Um, <coughs> And you know, and the discourse of the master, you can say, drops away, but it's replaced by what Lacan would call the discourse of the university, right? which is the discourse that we're <coughs> the academic machine discourse. And you know, and that's that's how I pay the bills, right? So the um, the issue for me, I mean, I guess the desire that's being articulated here, which is a, a desire of which I'm partially conscious, not through me, but through other people, is a kind of hysterical desire. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it sounds right. The more, the more you talk about it, it, it 
feels less like a stab. But if, if the problem of the hysteric is that they can't stop lamenting. Yes. That, um, that just sounds a, a, a philosophy of lament. I'm not sure what that would look like. Okay. <coughs> um, the Something like this. I mean, the... Let's look at Hamler. Think about Hamler. Um, um, Hamlet says he loved Ophelia once. I loved you once, he says. Um, they said, I did not love you. But I loved you once. Um, when she's dead, he jumps into the fucking grave, right? Because Laertes, her brother's in the grave, um, and he's lamenting. And Hamlet says, you know, brother, I mean, I can, I loved her with the power of a hundred thousand brothers, could not equal my love. Right? That's obsessional love, which is the love for what's impossible. It's only when she's dead that you finally love her. Because it's in, if you, when she's there, you don't see her, you don't hear her. You reduce her either to uh, an object of idealized love, or you turn her into a poor, which is exactly what Hamlet does get thy way to a nunnery, right? He, he, he debases her. So the, the logic of obsessionality, uh, or the lo for me, the logic of obsessionality, which is the way I've defined the logic of male sexuality, is about the splitting of the object of desire in relationship to an experience of love, which is idealized, and an experience of desire, which is debased, right? And the two things are in separate orbits. Freud will say, you know, in his uh, more sceptical moments, maybe that's just the way things are. Eros and s desire and civilization are just maybe in different orbits and we're never going to bring them together. The hysteric on this picture offers another possibility. And what, the hi what interests the hysteric is not uh, the, impossibili the impossibility of love, but something that can't be satisfied. Right? So what the... Um, so... If you like, if the obsessional is a the obsessional is about impossible desire, the hysteric is about unsatisfiable desire, right? And what I guess as a obsessional male, I am idealizing in tragedy is that figure of if you like hysterical unsatisfiability. I find myself extraordinary. This is a bit too confessional, but you know, <laughs> the end of me. I find myself hugely drawn to these figures like Phaedra and uh, Medea and uh, Clytemnestra and Cassandra, Cassandra in particular. You know, because something is being, some lack of satisfaction is being articulated. You know, and what what is what is the demand? The demand is, the demand is that love and desire be in the same place. Right? So <coughs> the obsessional has, um, has split the two up. Right? Can they be in the same place? Well, you know, um, it's a question. You're right. Worry about your cough. Um, can they be in the same place? Can they be held together? <clears throat> I don't see that in Antigone so much. Antigone just... Phew, she's gone. Just a question on that. The, um, I was just thinking the earlier you said the women were pushed away. You know, get out of here. This is a whole social in, uh, in, philo in the philosophical <coughs> yeah, in the, in the scene, as it were. And, uh, and yet in Hamlet, when Ophelia dies, he's, he's now passionately and obsessionally in love with her. When she's dead. Yeah. Yeah, but she's moved, I was just thinking of it in, like, in like Hans terms, she's moved into the symbolic. Yeah. And so a lot of these women in these plays are only there when they're in the symbolic, but otherwise they can exist. Sure. Out of here. Um, you know, that this is something about, you know, 
male sexuality and the impossibility of actually having a relationship to the person that's actually there. Mm. <laughs> Isn't it? I think it's one lesson of psychoanalysis is that you know you always have a relationship with what's not there. This is why, you know, uh, by, by, I'm not talking about essential sex, we're talking about, you know, gender construction in a certain economy, right? With that caveat. But the, um, it's uh, about absence, you know, uh, male sexuality and um, the uh, extraordinary fondness for love's past, love's lost, love which, loves which are impossible, right? Uh, or loves which are to come. But the here and now is evacuated. There's that structure as well, which is interesting. But this nature of this this hysteria, I think, is important. I mean, it's um, and I don't I don't claim to have a, an overview of it, but it's you know, um, I recognise what you're saying. I don't know what to do with it, to be honest. But you know, when uh, <coughs> remember Flaubert's deathbed scene, right? When Flaubert says about Madame Bovary, you know, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. There's the historical design. You construct. And this, this is this is this is about fantasy as well. I think you know another figure I haven't talked about is Ibsen. And again, Ibsen fascinates me because of the the way in which he's constructing a certain historical desire through the construction of uh, the, these figures, Hedda Gabler and the rest. Yeah, I mean, uh, it just seems that. Um, Tragedy offers a uh, richer, uh, a broader, deeper, and more ambiguous landscape than the landscape offered by uh, not by philosophy. I'm not. I'm not criticizing. I'm not. It's not as simple as that. But you get what I, you get. What I mean. Um, if you begin from if, if the question of gender is, 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 is a really fundamental philosophical question, it has to change the way in which you approach the issue of thinking, right? You can't just carry on as before, it seems to me. You either, you either it sh has to shift. I mean, isn't, yeah. Yeah. two things immediately came into my head uh, a second ago. Uh, there was a book on Nietzsche, first. Yes. He's talking a lot about this sort of problematic of Yes, he is. He is. And, and starting off with the quote from Nietzsche of what if truth is a woman. Yep. It's one of the idols. Uh, and, the, and the idea of maybe thinking itself. Uh, you know, the way I always interpret, and I'm completely wrong here, uh, the concept of truth being always at a distance and the obsession to really women, perhaps, at least the way I. And I'd be happy to be enlightened for everyone here because uh, that concept is is that women know more than any better than anyone that the concept of woman is at best uh, something placed on them or is, used to be during Nietzsche's yes. time. I mean, the paradox here is that the paradox here for me <coughs> is that there is uh, a another aspect of the romantic interpretation of tragedy is an idealization of the feminine. So that the um, so when Hegel says woman is the eternal irony of the community, or George Steiner in his book on Antigone's will wax you know lyrical and teary eyed about uh, feminine characters in tragedy. There's something nauseating about that. I don't think these female characters in tragedy are the representative of any truth about women, right, or any truth about woman, whatever that might be. It's more of, um, um, if you like, this is why I was saying that there's a, there's a, this is where we need to return to the question of, of queerness in a way, yeah. right? And how we think about queerness in relationship to tragedy. Because it seems to me that, you know, so it's not, this is where I, you know, I've got my problems with Lacan, and when other people have got problems, it seems to be that the way in which sexual difference is articulated there, it risks becoming a, a kind of theology, right? And not, not in Lacan, he's too clever, but in, in Lacanians, particularly, you know, French ones. Um, but, you know, if tragedy is about, you know, if we, if we, if we allow, tra think about the tragedy in a more, you know, way, I mean, queer, not necessarily the, maybe the best word, but that's the word that we have. 
it's it's one where we're shown the you know the ambiguity and instability of uh, of these categories and how uh, the, there's a uh, so rather than you know Antigone being essentially feminine, she is this strange you know queer compound of different forces, right? uh, which she will mobilize in her in her way, and so is Crayon too, right? and so is Tiresias. So um, that's sort of odd, and you know having having begun to think about tragedy many years ago, not that I've, I've not worked on it for long, but I've been thinking about it for a long time, and having thought it's about essential, the, the essential sexual difference between men and women, having, I remember thinking that. But for me, the reading of tragedy, uh, in particular the thinking this through with Judith, has just been, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, it just doesn't add up. It's not what's going on. What's going on is something else, uh, seems to me. Um, any, uh, we've got to stop at some point, I suppose. Any, any last words? As if you're going to spring into my feet. <laughs> you don't have to. No, I was thinking now about this. Uh, I mean, usually uh, men uh, represent the role and kind of emotions are represented by women. But if in a uh, tragedy, we see on, in a Greek tragedy, we see only men on the scene, uh, somehow I have the impression that uh, it's everything about emotion. Everything about? Alone. That uh, uh, I, I mean, how actually Gre uh, people in Greece uh, uh, would know anything about law? I get impression so that it's love or law? Law, law, law. 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 Yeah. Okay. And uh, I get impression that uh, that all this construction of theater is somehow used to to present. Pretty weird way of proving the law. Yeah. Pretty weird way of proving the yeah. law. Could be. Read, you can read the Oresteia that way. You know, really. But it's so it's but it's so riddled with yeah. things that yeah. complicate that. But yeah, I, yeah, you could see it that way. I, I completely yeah. agree. Somehow we are including all these dilemmas, contradiction, everything, but this is the law. Yeah, I think it shows. Um, you know, if you like, it shows the uh, tragedy displays the legal symbolic order that governs the city, uh, but it shows it in its inherent uh, ambiguity and contradictory state. That's what's peculiar. If you were going to two things, if you were going to produce a sort of state-sponsored art, right, that was going to justify the law, you could imagine something much less ambiguous than, and didactic than Greek tragedy. And there's been thousands of examples of that, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you could imagine something closer to, you know, forms of uh, conventional religious practice, or you know, uh, you know, the way in which our socialist realism or whatever it might be. We could imagine much more didactic aesthetic practices. Tragedy is an odd one to come up with. Um, Oh, I was going to say something else in relationship to that. It shows the uh, the limits of law, you know, the the undermining of sovereignty, the whole the whole package. It seems to me it it it, it replays the um, it 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 relives, the, as I said yesterday, the history of violence out of which we emerged. Something like that. And if that violence has become a legal order, it's a legal order which is still supported by violence. Something like that. And that's a very strange thing to... to oh, the other thing I was going to say is, I mean, the, the other way of transposing this and rethinking it would be 
And also going back to the question of gender, would be in relation to Shakespearean tragedy. The, the strange thing about Greek tragedy is its centrality to the city, right? It's public art. Uh, but Shakespearean tragedy is a different thing. It's outside the city. It's um, where the, the brothels, the, 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 uh, the gambling halls and the, the bear pits are uh, on the edges of outside London and the playgrounds. And it's the place where um, gender roles are obviously subverted. Right? So in a sense, there'd be a separate um, way of thinking about Shakespeare, I think, in, in this way. But... Um, that's an art that's always outside the city. Um, you know, Shakespeare in the theatre is men dressing up as women as well. Um, well, we're going to do some Shakespeare at 8.30 uh, at the lecture. But I'll see you all there. Let's get some delicious tuna salad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.